about the financial analysis when you're looking at companies is how does one think about it as an outside investor? How do you think about your company from the perspective of an outside investor, thinking about the shares that are being priced in one way or another in the marketplace and also um, how you compare with the industry um, going forward? And that's this last section that we'll talk about. You, you think about the equity ownership of a company, it's shares of the company that are being issued. That means if you're buying a ownership in a company, there are a certain number of outstanding shares. Perhaps there's a billion outstanding shares. Uh, for years when I worked at AT&T, it was nice of them to have an, a, a billion outstanding shares. So it was an easy calculation, roughly a billion, but a billion was a, a good enough uh, for rounding purposes. So it was easy to calculate if somebody had a um, hundred million shares, what percent of uh, of the business that would be. Um, so you could, you could calculate that all out. So you know what a share is worth of the total earnings. It's exactly a percent, as long as there's not um, some particular provisions there. So per share data says, if you take the total earnings of the company and you divide by the number of outstanding shares, um, then you get the earnings per share. Uh, let me just digress for one second. This chart says, number of outstanding shares and has diluted in parentheses. Diluted means that you are, you are assuming in this equation that anyone that has an option that's issued by the treasury, a treasury option in the company, that option is executed or is, uh, is uh, realized so that the person who has the option gets some of the earnings. So since it's diluted, there's a total number of shares that is larger than the number of shares that are actually have been exercised or actually um, in the marketplace because some people just have an option to give the treasury money and buy a share of the company at a lower price than is currently being traded. And in that particular case, they would have a claim to the earnings. So the earnings per share, diluted earnings per share, takes that um, that eventuality into, into account. In this particular case, we know the net income. This is Starbucks overall in 2011, so we know the income. And so their earnings per share, fully diluted shares, is $1.62 per share. So buy a share, that's the amount of earnings that you get. You do not necessarily get a check for that. That's the earnings that the company gets for your share, and then the board of directors decides how much the company keeps to invest in future projects and how much they give you as an investor in the context of a dividend payment, which is a different uh, calculation. Um, let's see, a different calculation. That's the actual cash that you receive for a stock, and that is the dividends, total dividends paid divided by the number of outstanding shares. Now notice in this particular case, if the shares are not exercised, they don't get a dividend. So here you take the total dividends paid and you send that out to the people who actually have shares. So it's not a fully diluted number anymore because if you only own an option, you do not get a dividend. And so in this case, there's a different number and you get 52 cents per share is what the dividend is, okay? Um, if it was zero, then you get no dividends, okay? Um, so that's, that's how the process of uh, calculating dividends work. That's the return you get. And that number is called the percent of, you know, you take the 52 cents and you put it over top of your, the amount that the share price is currently trading at, which we'll talk about in a, in a future uh, lecture. And that becomes what's called the dividend yield or the percent return that comes from dividends associated with owning a particular share. So if you own shares of a company and you own them yourself, not through a broker who holds, the, holds them for you, you actually get in the mail a check for the amount of shares you earn and the dividend payments that you get. And those checks come in the mail and you can cash them and they're your money. Um, if you own shares through a broker, the broker processes all that and it just goes into your account and you sometimes reinvest in additional shares. So that is the, um, the idea of how that translates into returns 
for the investor, that is the dividend return for the investor. You can use all of this. One of the key things we talked about in accounting is that it gives you a, 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 a common set of language, a common set of information and data that you can use to compare one company to another. And so now that means, because this is publicly available information, if it's public companies, you can look at ratios for your company and compare them to other companies. Um, some companies have higher ratios and do better than others. Some of them, do too, some companies can have a different structure internally and both be doing very well, even though they're in the same industry. So you have to have a lot of knowledge about how all of these pieces come together in order to really be an effective investor. But you take a look and um, at what's going on with companies and see what what exactly might be the situation. Um, for example, um, the after-tax profits in McDonald's increased, uh, but Starbucks increased even more. McDonald's went up 22%, but Starbucks went up 30, uh, 30 300%. Um, they both look good, right? So you got to decide which. What is this a one-time event or is this something that's going to continue? Um, you can compare one to another. Uh, you can earn the same profit, but one has higher growth prospects or more profit into the future. So you have to make those assessments. And that's what people do. They build models of these various kinds of events to see whether or not you want to be an, a McDonald's investor or whether you want to be a Starbucks investor for the price of the share. So you have to understand how much value you're going to get because the share is priced, the shares are also priced different in the marketplace. If you look at these kinds of numbers, this shows you the comparison between Starbucks and McDonald's. You might have a profit margin, which McDonald's has a higher profit margin, but Starbucks might be growing faster. There's different returns on assets. They're actually quite similar in this particular case. Uh, McDonald's has a higher return on equity than. Um, than, than uh, Starbucks has. So you want to dive more deeply and try to understand that. It probably means the, um, the equity is, um, is a lower than, um, has a, is a smaller ratio than, than you might see on, um, uh, the, the, the equity is a smaller ratio than you, would like, you might see on for Starbucks. And actually, if you look down the list, you'll see that, that um, McDonald's has more debt, so there is less equity in McDonald's than there is at um, this is the debt to total assets line, the fourth from the bottom. We already saw that Starbucks had 40%, McDonald's is 50%. That's debt. So the opposite of that is equity. 60% is of Starbucks is equity, but only 44% is equity for McDonald's. So you can see why there's a higher return on ass on equity, and you can see all various other ones that we looked at. You can see how fast McDonald's turns over its inventory, 231 times um, per year, almost every day, uh, more than every day and a half, they turn over their inventory, their meat, their buns, everything. Um, so that's uh, a very fast uh, operation. Um, so you can see these, how these various things play out, and it's making sense of them, which is what financial analysis is all about. It's what people and Wall Street do to try and understand where the opportunities are and also what investors do who are active investors, private equity firms and other types of people that come in and buy companies to see where they might be able to make some changes and improve the profits and the viability of the business going forward. All of this will conclude here, but all of this, if you think about it, comes about because we're using the same language, the same rules. And we can trust, we learn to trust based upon the um, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, um, the Financial Standards Board, all those things that allow us to look at one company and another company and compare apples to apples. And the legal and regulatory structure that requires the reporting of this information to the public so that we can compare these, we can make assessments, we can put our money to use. And we can find ways that as an investor, we get the kind of returns that we need so that our money is working for us in the most effective way possible. You remember early on in the class, we talked about the fact that, that um, you can make a lot of money with money, but it's not easy and you have to spend the time and you have to work at it. It's a kind of work. You put the money to work, but it's not 
You just don't put it somewhere and dumbly wait for things to happen. There's a lot of work and knowledge and understanding and um, anticipation and discipline that goes into making sure that your money is working for you hard and well, just like you physically or intellectually work at your classwork and other things. You make your money work the same way and you have to use all the tools that are given to you to make that work effectively. With that, we'll wrap up the, um, this story and uh, we'll see you uh, in class and in the next lecture. Take care. Bye.